Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, if you got your Bibles, turn over to the book of Revelation. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 3. It's the last book in the Bible. If you don't, like Earl already said, there's some free, well, there's one free on each table. So um, it will have the scriptures on the screen behind us. But that was uh, really good. That was really good. So Kash is, is very talented. So we are in Revelation chapter 3, and we're continuing on our series as we look to what Jesus has to say to us, that he speaks to us today. And, and we're looking through how he speaks to these, these seven churches in the book of Revelation. And he's got a word for them. And in each one at the end, it says, that he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so he's speaking to us today that we're supposed to be this unstoppable force created by him to impact this world but so many times we don't see that. We don't see that. And so we are in Revelation chapter 3. And the first thing I want us to look at and see is we've heard, tell me if you ever heard this before. Perception is reality. Has anybody ever heard that before? It's not true. It's baloney. Perception is not reality. Perception is not reality. All right? We live in a time where we want others to see us a certain way. We want others to view us a certain way. We want to have this perception, that we have this reputation, and we want others to think of us a way. But Jesus sees right through those things, and he sees right into our hearts, right into our minds. And I was talking to a friend this week about this, but you can see this wherever you look. Uh, you can see this all over the place. Uh, for example, this week, uh, one of my favorite basketball players, Kevin Durant. Everybody know who Kevin Durant is? Just won the championship. He's one of the best basketball players in the world. When he retires, he'll be considered one of the greatest. Uh, he, he's amazing. And he took a lot of flack. People threw a lot of shade his way because he switched teams last year. And what happened this week is that he would take, people would say stuff about him and what he would have, he had these secret social media accounts where he would defend himself, but not under his name, under a pseudonym. He would defend himself even against high school basketball players and pundits and the like, but he was caught this week and it came out and he said some really terrific things about his old team and, and it was just revealed and he was caught with it of this guy who was one of the best basketball players, super influential, worth hundreds of millions of dollars, has to defend himself and his reputation against high school basketball students. Isn't that crazy to think about? And I don't want to beat up on him because I like Kevin Durant, but I can also relate with him. And we live so much like this, I would say. Is our life is almost like this balloon. All right, we live a certain way. We, we want others to view us a certain way, and we're trying to please others, and we take up all this pressure. It's kind of like this. All right, we get other people, uh, what they think about us, and we're striving, and we're striving to, to live up to other people's standards. And it just fills our hearts and our lives up with all this pressure. And we take on more and more. And from being kind of healthy, we just take on more expectations. We try to take on this, per this, this, this perception of what others want us to be. All right, you see this? And our life keeps getting full and full. <laughs> and we're never supposed to be that way. Instead of what, how others define us, Jesus was supposed to define us, but we don't live that way. And we have all this pressure. <laughs> and what eventually happens? <laughs> and it keeps filling up. And it better break, or I'm gonna pass out. It's a big balloon. <laughs> Not going the way I wanted it to. There we go. And when we're trying to please everybody, we please nobody. When we lose sight of the one who actually loves us and knows everything about us, who knows what's best for us, and we take on everybody else's expectations of who we should be, it just crushes us. It leaves us with being who we were never created to be. And when we live off of our reputation, it will not bring us the life that Jesus wants to bring to us. He's got something better for us. 
And we talk about this idea of this movement, that how God designed his church to be, and he designed us to be in this, this life-giving movement of knowing him, of being known by him, of impacting those around us with this life-giving power. And we have that at times, and that's his design for the church and design for us as individuals. And some of us experience that. Some of us are there right now. But we do, it's just like the life cycle of, of churches, it happens to ourselves, we get into this monument, we get stuck, we get stuck of recalling the past and we're just stuck where we are. And if we stay that way, eventually we become this place of a mausoleum, a place of death, of no life, of no passion, of no purpose, of no meaning, we lose it. And then it happens so slowly at times. Sometimes it's a very slow fade that we don't even recognize it. But Jesus does, and he speaks to us about it. And he has words of love. And sometimes they're sharp, but they all come from a heart of love and care for us to be corrected, to, to, to hear what he has to say, to evaluate our hearts and our minds with what he's speaking to us. So we're in Revelation chapter 3. We want to be this movement of God. We start in verse 1, and we meet a church that has become a mausoleum, a place of the dead. And here's what it says. To, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And so, this, again, the book of Revelation was written to these seven churches. We have a little picture of here for you to see this. These were real places in real cities. You have all seven of these. This is modern day Turkey called Asia Minor. And you had all seven of these churches were all in this area. And Jesus cared very deeply about each one of them. And, and he was speaking to them. And this church lost sight of who they were. They lost sight of God's grace and his power. But, and, and at the beginning of every church, of every way, he always has this vivid description of who Jesus is. And the way he describes himself here is really interesting. He could have used anything, but he says to him who has the seven spirits of God. And what does that mean, the seven spirits of God? This is the idea of, uh, it's a metaphor describing the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. The, per, the seven was a perfect number. That the Holy Spirit's described as having the seven spirits of God, perfect in unity, the life-giving spirit. That Jesus is, is spoken here as the one who, who brings life out of death who brings light to darkness, and he can give this to us. This is what the Holy Spirit does. And how bad do we need that message? How bad do we need that today as we live in around this area of, of death and of never being able to live under God's freedom and grace, but always under the pressure of what others feel from us, whether it's a suffocating family situation or whether it's our own pride building our identity of others' opinions. Jesus says, I am the one who has the seven spirits of God. I am the one who's come to bring life to you. I'm the one who's come to bring life to you. So let's look. Let's just see how he describes this church. Describes this church. He says this, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Let me read that again. I know your works. Now, Jesus knows all these, everything they're doing. This might have been a busy place. People were doing things. He says, I know your works. You have a reputation. You have a reputation of being important, of being alive, but you are dead. And every one of these churches that he's writing to here, he's speaking to something that went on in the history of this city and this place. Back then, citizens had a great civil pride. They would know all of their history. They would know everything that's been done to it. There was a great civil pride with knowing who you were. You stay there. We live in a very transient city. Uh, I mean, a very transient time. We move around quite a bit. When I moved here to Walled Lake, Commerce Township, I really, I'm actually not sure what city we live in. Is it Commerce Township? Is it Walled Lake? I don't really know how that works still, but I have no idea about the history. Now, I care about the city, but I don't know about all the history of it. But, but, but people back then would know all about it. And Jesus uses things to speak to them, recalling the history of what took place. And this city, Sardis, had a reputation of being one of the premier places in the world. It, it was this way. It, isn't, it wasn't anymore, but it was this way. Because this was the place that historians believe where modern currency actually was invented. 
Oh, we have another picture here. This is a gold coin from this discovered in this city 2,400 years ago. This, they believe this is the first coin ever using currency. It was, this, it, was, it was invented here in this city. They had a ruler, this guy named Croesus. Uh, you ever heard the king Midas touch? You know, the Midas touch, anything you touch becomes gold. It came from this place. This king Croesus, who, who really put this city on the map, at this time, they invented something that no other city or place in the world ever could invent. Uh, they would use gold for trading and such, but you never knew how much gold was involved because you couldn't separate it from the other alloys. Silver and gold, you, could, you had all this other stuff that was part of it. They actually learned how to separate it and purify it, so they knew that the gold that came from this place was the best in the entire world. And this caused a crazy amount of wealth, a crazy amount of reputation and pride. It created a crazy amount of being known. And then we even say that today. We even use this, this term, I think older people use it, riches crisis. They would describe Rockefeller that way. I never heard it until I re researched it. But it was a statement that uh, they would describe really wealthy people. And this came from this city. This was the reputation this was the reputation of what they were. This is the economic revolution took place in here. But, but, what took, but, but they lived out this reputation. And they wanted to be viewed this way, but they weren't that important anymore. They lost sight of these things. Their great wealth created this complacency, this, this false assurance, this, this great comfort that they were not vigilant anymore. And they drifted, and they drifted into obscurity. So Jesus speaks to him. He says, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You are dead. And so what does a dead church look like? What does that look like? I want to give you an example of one of those. Uh, today in Scotland, there's a place called St. Mary's Cathedral. This is a church that lives under the God of inclusive, being inclusive to others. They, they uh, recently, during a calendar, the church calendar this year, they have this thing called Epiphany. We don't really celebrate it here in the West, but it's, it's a little bit bigger out uh, in Europe. Um, this idea of Epiphany, that's a celebration in the church calendar where you uh, recognize Jesus as the Son of God who came to save all people, Jew and Gentile. During their celebration of Epiphany, one of a huge time in the church calendar, this, this, this church, they invited a young Muslim woman to come in and to read from the Quran. They thought it would be a great way of, of bringing unity in the city. And so she did. She came in. She had a beautiful voice, and she sang from the Quran. She sang from it a scripture that denied that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, denied that he was God himself and the Savior of the world. And they didn't even blink an eye. This was going on in the middle of the church. And then afterwards, they took some pushback and some flack, and, and, and they doubled down. To quote them, here's what they said. This was a wonderful event. We were joined by friends from two local Muslim communities. And we're going to do this. We've done this in the past. We're going to continue to do this in the future. Now, if the church doesn't know that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, what is that place? Is it a church anymore? What hope are you giving to others? What life are you giving? You just... You're just blending into the culture. You're blending into the expectations of what others want about you. And it's not just ideas of truth either. I had a friend growing up who used to love to fish. He would drive around and fish anywhere he could go. And one day he found a nice pond that was a good fishing spot in front of this big, huge church. This church that could hold over thousands of people. And it, the attendance of that place had dwindled to about 100. And he was there one night by himself just enjoying the time, doing his thing. And the pastor of the church came out, and he thought he was going to invite him to church to come. But instead of that, he said, hey, do you go here? Do you attend this place? And my friend said, no, I don't. And the pastor said, well, you need to pick up your stuff and leave because you're not welcome here. You're not welcome here unless you go to this church. And he's like, what are you doing, man? Where are you back? This is this lack of love, this lack of being the light of the world, this lack of ministering to others and caring about others, this, this lack of generosity. You don't represent Jesus. You're just so focused on yourself. It's a church that lived off its past reputation of being influential. So we have the areas where you can do this in our own lives. 
We can cave to what our culture expects of us. We can lack so much love for other people. What about you? My friends, what about you? Where are you at? Are you living off of the reputation of the past of what others think of you? Are you having all this pressure of trying to appease other people, of being a people pleaser? Or are you looking to the one who can give you true life? And so what Jesus does here, he gives us a remedy. He gives us a remedy to experience healing. And I, I just put this down into like an acrostic of ARK. All right, everyone say A-R-K. A-R-K. If you put an M in front of it, you spell Mark. All right, cool. All right. A-R-K. Just take out the M, all right? And so, ARK. Jesus shows us three ways to remedy this. Again, he's come to bring life. He's come to bring joy to us. He's come to relieve all that pressure. He's come to bring us something else. Here's what he says in, in verse 2. A-R-K. First one, he says, awaken. He says, wake up and strengthen what is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. There's a popular saying today, especially for young adults, it's, it's stay woke. Anybody hear that? Stay woke. Some of them heard it. People are in t-shirts. Most of you middle-aged people have never heard it. It's okay. You're still cool in my book, right? It originated from Jesus. He says, wake up, awaken, wake up. You need to awaken to what's going on. And see where you have fallen asleep. See where you have drifted. See where you've caved into the pressures of those around you. And you've lost sight of who I am. You've lost sight of my love. You've lost sight of my purposes for you. You've lost sight of what you should be doing. And he says, strengthen what is about to die because it's going to be extinguished if you don't. If you don't awaken, it's going to go away. And this is a big deal for us today. We live in a time and a place where media is so prevalent. Anywhere you look, from TV to magazines to social media to, to, to just things, to movies. And everything is trying to preach to us. We don't view it this way, but it's true. Trying to tell us a narrative. Trying to tell us what we should believe and what we shouldn't believe. What we should value and what we shouldn't value. And some of that, don't get me wrong, some of it's, some of it's good. There's a, there's a big power in the media. Some of it's good. They bring light to darkness. They reveal some things. They, some of it's good, but, but I would say a lot of it is trash. A lot of it is trash. All you got to do is turn on TV, you know, TV shows that, that promote adultery and fornication and sleeping around and all these different values of what you should be and what you, how you should accept and tolerate other people and what's okay and what's not okay, how you should view God and how you shouldn't view God. And I'll give you one example of this. This was made the Nationals a little bit ago, but Teen Vogue, a magazine that was written for preteens and teenagers, Teen Vogue, this is supposed to be for preteens and teenagers, just produced a huge article with all these graphs talking about kids how to commit sodomy and how to do it in the right way. Teen Vogue, a place for preteens, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and young teenagers, producing this and thinking that this is a good thing for our culture and our society. Like, where are we? What is going on? What's, what, what is going on in the world? And the same thing that's happened today has happened repeatedly over and over and over again. In this city of Sardis, you would have all of these ideas and thoughts and what is acceptable, what is not. The same pressure is there, but they were just being so comfortable where they were. They weren't awakened to what's really taking place, of what's really showing on, what's really being taught and how people are trying to make you believe what they believe. Who are we going to believe? Are we going to believe Jesus? Or are we going to believe others? Are we going to believe our own thoughts at times? Are we going to actually evaluate the truth and look into it? Are we going to just accept our own doubts, our own presuppositions? Are we going to actually evaluate the evidence? And I want to look at a person. I want to give you a story of a person who didn't awaken up. And it's one of the most tragic stories I have ever read of a, of a man who was on this path and he became a mausoleum and, and, and he couldn't get out of it. And, and he didn't strengthen, he didn't wake up and he, he eventually just sputtered out. Uh, anybody ever hear of Charles Templeton? Charles Templeton, not really very well known. But have you heard of Billy Graham? Everybody, put, raise your hand if you heard of Billy Graham. I think everybody knows who Billy Graham is. Well, at the beginning of, their of Billy Graham's ministry, 
Him and this other guy named Charles Templeton were actually started uh, to, out together. And they would speak to crowds of 10 to 30,000 people all over the world. And Templeton was viewed as the better preacher, more anointed by God, and who was going to become more famous. And Billy Graham was going to be second fiddle to him. Templeton had everything going on, everything going on for him. And then what happened, though, with him, him and Billy Graham were great friends. They would room together. Templeton started listening to the culture. He went to a, a liberal university where he was studying theology and doubting everything about the Bible, if he could believe it or not, doubting if Jesus really was the Son of God. And he had these doubts, which that's okay. You can have doubts. But he was bringing through these doubts, and they were controlling him, and he was caving into the pressure of what the world was saying he should believe. And he talked to Billy Graham, and he said, Billy, how can you believe the Bible? Look at all these stories. And Billy Graham said, I have my own doubts as well. But I know that this is God's word. I know it's true. I believe it. And I still, I have my own questions and my own doubts, but I'm taking this at face value. I'm believing it. And the rest was history. Billy Graham became Billy Graham. And Charles Templeton became an agnostic and an atheist and drifted off. And there's a story from Lee Strobel. He wrote a book, The Case for Faith. And Lee Strobel got to sit down to do an interview with Templeton, who was in his 80s who was, you know, he was still in the right mind, a good, you know, a speaking partner, but he was at near the end of his life. And he sat down to do an interview with him for his book. And I want to read to you this transcript from Lee Strobel. He was talking to him, and, and he says, Strobel says to, to Charles Templeton, how do you assess this Jesus? Because Templeton was adamant that he didn't believe in the Bible. He didn't believe in what God, a God or a God at all. There was no chink in his armor. But then Strobel says, well, what do you think about Jesus? And Templeton's body language softened. Here's what Strobel writes. As if he suddenly relaxed, felt relaxed and comfortable in talking about an old dear friend. His voice, which at times had displayed such a sharp and insistent edge, now took on a melancholy and reflective tone. His guard seemingly down, he spoke in an unhurried pace, almost nostalgically, carefully choosing his words as he talked about Jesus. Templeton began, he was the greatest human being who's ever lived. He was a moral genius, an ethical sense he was unique. He was the intrinsically wisest person I've ever encountered in my life or in my readings. Now this is from this atheist. His commitment was total, and it led to his own death, much to the detriment of the world. What could one say about him except that he was the form of greatness? Strobel writes, I was taken back. He says, you, must, you sound like you really care about him. Templeton says, well, yes, he is the most important thing in my life. Let me read that again. This is an atheist who denies who Jesus is. He says, this, he is the most important thing in my life. And I, 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 he was stuttering, searching for the right words. I might, it might know it might sound strange, but I have to say, I adore him. I adore Jesus. Everything good I know, everything decent I know, everything pure I know, every, I learned it from Jesus. And Jesus was tough. He cascaded people. He was angry. People don't think of him that way, but they're not reading their Bibles. He had a righteous anger. He cared about the oppressed and the exploited there's no question that he had the highest moral standard, that he was the least duplicitous in his attitude. He had the greatest compassion of any human being in history. There have been many wonderful people, but Jesus is Jesus. And he goes on, oh, but no, he said slowly, he's the most, stopped, he started again, he said, in my view, he's the most important human being who's ever lived. And then he uttered the words that Strobel thought he would never would hear, he says, if I may put it this way, I miss him. I miss him. And at that, tears flooded his eyes. He turned his head and looked downward, raising his left hand to shield his face and bobbed his shoulders and wept and wept. And after a little time of awkwardness, he wiped away the tears from his eyes and he said, enough of that, enough of that. That Jesus, this guy who denied him, couldn't get him out of his mind and his heart. This Jesus, that he, he knew him, but he kept going his own way. He kept going on his own path. 
And he was dead now in his faith. He knew Jesus at a time. He knew at least about him. And even here, he says, I miss him. How, how sad is that? And that's what Jesus is saying here. Wake up. Strengthen is what is about to die. Heaven is too good. Hell is too terrifying. Eternity is too long for us to mistake who Jesus really is. It's too long. He's a God who loves us. And we need to be awakened to this thing. We cannot get outside of him. So Jesus not only says to awaken, but what else does he say? He says this, remember then what you've received and heard. So ark, awaken, R, re remember, 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 remember Jesus. Why? And if you read the Bible at all, God is always telling us to remember Remember what's been done. And we even have this in our culture. We have days set up that we remember, like Memorial Day. Uh, you know, we have days where we remember these things. Remember what's taken place. We remember the past. We don't stay in the past, but we remember what's been done. And God is always calling us to remember. Remember what you received and heard. And what is that? What's the message of the Bible? What did we receive and heard? That God wants us to be really religious? That God wants us to, to get our life in order to be really good? That's what so many people think the Bible is about. But at the core of it, it's not that. At the core of it is we see this God who loves us. And I think that's one of the hardest truths for us to grasp, that God really loves me. I am painfully aware of my own sinfulness, of my, my lack of self-control, my thoughts, of how quick I cool off in my zeal of how cheap my love for God is and I can't get that in my mind why would you love somebody like me do you know me and he says yes I love you and he says the same thing for each one of you and you can sit here and you're like oh that sounds great but really do you, do you grasp that do you remember that do you know that do you breathe that in does that define you that Jesus really loves you it's crazy I, I've used this example before, but I think it's good. A seminary professor asked a hundred of her students to write this, to answer this question, do you believe that God loves you? And out of a hundred, only two wrote yes. Seminary students. Some said, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but if I really believe it, and I know that the Bible tells me God love, loves me, but I don't really feel it. And if we look at the Bible, it always makes a beeline, always makes a beeline to the cross, to the cross and the resurrection of Jesus because it demonstrates God's great love for you. It demonstrates what he thinks of us. And we ask, Jesus, do you love me? I've heard it said before. Jesus says, yes. And he showed it by stretching out his arms and dying for you. Do you know that? Do you, if you remember that, remember what you received and heard. And I think it's hard for us to grasp because we're not very lovable. And we're, we, we're aware that deep down there's something wrong inside of us. We need to remember that too, that, that there is no salvation outside of him. That there is no forgiveness outside of Jesus. We remember what we received in her, that he is supreme, that he rules over all. We need to remember this stuff. We need to remember that there will be a judgment day. That the world will end one day, and it was in September 23rd, 2017, by the way. Anybody remember last week? I'm glad it wasn't because it was my birthday. And I'm celebrating it today, so hopefully it's not today. But if Jesus comes back, it's worth it. So, but anyhow, the world will end one day. Uh, I, I like to play golf. I don't get to play very much. I like to play it a lot. My, my, in, my in-laws were in last weekend, and me and my father-in-law got out on the course, and we were playing, and we, we were playing and having a good time, and all of a sudden we saw a bunch of ambulance and a bunch of, uh, of, of um, paramedics. They were doing some stuff. We didn't know what was going on, and we later found out a guy seemed perfectly healthy, enjoying a, a beautiful Saturday had a heart attack, and passed away on the golf course. Because we don't know when the end will come. We lose sight of these things. And God tells us, remember your life. You're not guaranteed it tomorrow. Remember these things. Remember what really matters. Remember what you truly should value. Remember this stuff. Remember who gives you life. Remember me. That's what he says. So not only awaken, not only remember, but finally he says, Keep. Here's, what he, here's how he finishes. He says, remember then what you received and heard in verse 3. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come 
against you. So not only do we need to remember it, but we need to keep it. And Jesus says, I will come like a thief. He's not talking about his second coming of his return. He's talking about something that was deeply embedded in the history of the city. They were a place of great wealth and great power, but that power produced complacency and a false insurance. And this city thought they were in Pregnable. They thought nobody could take them over. If you have a picture of it right here, here's some of the ruins of modern day today, this temple. But in the backdrop over there of this mountain, the city used to sit on this mountain. And on one side would be all these rocked edges that no, they thought no person could ever climb. And on the other side, they would be able to defend it from any force that came against it. And so their king, Croesus, became arrogant and he wanted to attack the Persian Empire, and he did. He was defeated. They retreated to their fortress here. They thought they were safe, and any attack that came forward, they always put it away. But on the other side of the city, where these jagged edges of these rocks were, they were so assured of their self and their safety. They were so complacent that they didn't even set one person to guard it. And so one of the Persian commanders sat there just to look at it, to see if there's any way to get by. And one soldier from this city of Sardis was just walking by and he dropped his helmet and it fell down on this edge. Pretty crazy story, but it's true in the history of it. And so the, this, this Persian commander watched him as this guy knew of this kind of this secret path. And this, this the guy got his helmet, went back, and just went on his day. And so they formulated a, pan, a plan. When they, Sardis thought they were safe, they attacked like a thief in the night. That's what the history would say. They, the Persians came upon them and conquered the city easily because there was not even a guard. And if you think that was bad, this happened another time 300 years later. And then it happened again in AD 17, this time not from an army, but from an earthquake they weren't ready for. And like a thief in the night, it struck the city. And Jesus is saying the same things. If you do not awaken, if you don't remember, if you don't keep this, I'm going to come against you like a thief in the night. You don't know when this will happen. You are supposed to be my people. Your judgment's not about what others think about you, not about your reputation. You are going to ultimately stand before me. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? So let's finish this. Here's what he says. He says, yeah, you still have a few people, a few names in Sardis. People have not soiled their garments in verse 4. They will walk with me in white for they are worthy. How sad. Just a few people are left. And finally, he says this, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now, back then, when you were part of a, a city under the Roman Empire, they would keep a list of all of its citizens. And your name could be blotted out if you embarrassed the city, if you were a criminal, or if you died, they would blot your name out. But Jesus is saying something here. He says, though they might want to push you out, though your name will be blotted out of this place, your name will never be blotted out of my book of life, of the only one that matters. I will always remember you. Even though you forget at times, I don't forget. And I will write your name and nobody can take it out of it. That death nor life can separate you from my love. And he says, I will give you a name that will be remembered. I will give you a name better than anything or anyone could give you. And I will confess it before my Father and before the angels in heaven. I will give you what you're looking for. I will give you this life. So my friends, I want us to bring this in here. I want us to bring this home. Remember this, this ark, awaken, remember, keep. Where are you this morning? Where are you on the spectrum. Where are you in your relationship with the Lord? What do you need to be awakened from? What do you need to remember? What do you need to keep? Are you bowing to the pressures of our, the modern day world? Are you lacking love for God and for others? Are you just going through the motions? Are you just feel like you're just dead on the inside? There's good news for you. There's grace. The church is not the Y key key for people who have it figured out for super saints. The church is a hospital for sinners. It's a place of grace, a place of life through Jesus Christ. And what I want to do, I want to invite the worship team out as we get a chance to respond to God's word. And I want to invite the worship team out. And what we're going to do is uh, just as you get a chance to pray here, to reflect, to pray for others, we're going to have elders at all of our exits, two on the top of each one and uh, two over here, one on each side. And they're going to make their ways there now. And, and uh, we, we think this is a big deal. We care deeply about every soul, just as Jesus does. We remember you. 
And we want to pray for you. If you feel like you have some, something that you need life in, if you, you, you can come and pray for, with one of our elders. If you have know somebody who has a need, you can come and do that and pray for that person with some of your elders. Uh, I was told as a, when I first became a follower of Jesus, told some good advice. It says, if somebody offers to pray for you, don't ever deny that. And now we have a chance to do this. And, and our worship team is going to lead us in some songs of reflection. The lights will dim and it'll be private. But come and, and, and receive this grace. Come and, and receive this if you have any need on whatever spectrum that is. So let me pray for us. And then we'll go into that. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for Jesus for being so kind to us. So loving and so gracious. Thank you that he does love us. No matter where we are, no matter what we've done. That he loves each and every one of us in this room. I pray that they would experience that. Pray for my friends that they would know that. Pray for all the needs. That, Lord, you would bring healing. That you would bring life here. Pray that you would bless our time as we listen and set our hearts to you. And we call upon you in prayer. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.